remember what we already discussed. So we talked about Charles Goodyear and how he created vulcanized rubber. And then we talked about Elias Howe and the invention of the sewing machine and how he got a patent for it overseas. But when he came back, someone else, Mr. Singer, had already gotten a patent here. So Elias Howe sued Mr. Singer and then he died two years later after he got all that money. Then we talked about Samuel Morse and how he invented the telegraph and how they created the Morse code to use on the telegraph. Then we talked about whaling and the different parts that were used in a sperm whale. We talked about um, how they're used for oil in lamps and stuff like that and then the clipper ships and how they were used for trade but they weren't used for trade very long because better ships were made to go through the Panama Canal and other shortcuts that were created. Then we talked about industries and factories in the Northeast and how more and more were built and then we talked about Cyrus McCormick and the invention of the Reaper which made farming a lot easier and he moved to the river to get his um, Reaper out to different farmers and then we talked about railroads and how they linked the Midwest to the north and we talked about the railroads in South Carolina and how there were lots and lots of railroads created at that point. Then we talked about Eli Whitney and how he created the cotton gin in 1793. And that helped to really speed up the collection of raw cotton. And we talked about how that raw cotton was sent to Great Britain. And Great Britain turned it into goods that they sold back to us. And then eventually the factories in the Northeast were where we sent the raw cotton to. Um, we talked about how Great Britain did not back the South in the Civil War, even though the, the South thought that they would because cotton was so important to the economy there. We talked about slave conditions, about house slaves and field slaves, and how they shared one-room shacks, and they sold families to separate places and they never saw each other again they were only given like one pair of clothes kids had to work in the fields we talked about all of that we also talked about free slaves um, how they may have been given their freedom by their owners when they died or they could have bought their own freedom by working um, and how they moved to the north to work but most of the free slaves lived in the south and then we talked about the anti-slavery movement and how people were pushing for um, no more slavery in the south so now we're going to talk about freedom fighters so many people both white and black fought for the end of slavery in the united states and frederick Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth were two famous abolitionists or fighters for freedom. That's what abolitionist means, fight for freedom. And they both knew firsthand how horrible slavery could be because they had spent part of their lives as slaves. And who would be better to spread the word about freedom for slaves than two former slaves? Sometimes the most powerful messages can come from those who have suffered injustices. These people sometimes become great leaders in the fight for change so that others don't have to suffer similar fates. So Joyner Truth, her journey begins in 1797. A slave named Isabella was born in New York. Isabella lived and worked for three different owners who all treated her harshly. Although she never learned to read or write, she was an inspiration to her fellow slaves. When she was 13, her final owners bought her. In New York, a law was passed that gave freedom to all slaves born before July 4, 1799. Isabella fit into this category, but her freedom was not granted until 1827. That's a long time. 
and during her time as a slave in New York, Isabella married and had five children. Shortly before she was to be freed, Isabella found out that her owners were trying to keep her a slave. In desperation, she ran away, leaving her husband and children behind. Isabella found support from a group of Quakers who enabled her to purchase her freedom. She became religious and began preaching for the end of slavery and for women's rights. At this time, she changed her name to Sojourner Truth. This name represented the journey for truth that she was beginning. During her life, Sojourner Truth was the first black woman to fight a white man in court and win. She did this over the illegal sale of one of her sons. Sojourner's story was published in 1850. She spent her life traveling around the country and preaching at prayer meetings and other public gatherings, teaching about slavery. Even after slavery was outlawed, she continued to fight for equal rights, both for women and for blacks. Many people in the early and mid 1800s fought to end slavery. One freedom fighter was a woman named Isabella Bumphrey. Isabella was born a slave in New York in about 1797, and from the time that she was a young child, she worked for owners who were cruel to her. In 1817, New York passed a law that said all slaves who were born before July 4th, 1799 would be free. Slaves were happy to hear this news, but the law also said that those slaves could not be freed until July 4th, 1827. Isabella had to wait 10 more years to get her freedom. And while she was waiting to be freed, Isabella married another slave named Thomas. Isabella and Thomas had five children. As the date for her freedom approached, Isabella heard that her master was planning to keep her as a slave despite the law that had been passed. She wanted her freedom so much that in 1826, she left her owner's estate, leaving behind her husband and their children. Isabella was finally freed in 1827. She never learned to read or write, but that didn't stop her from spreading her message about the evils of slavery. After Isabella gained her freedom, she began preaching for women's rights and the end to slavery. In the early 1840s, she changed her name to Sojourner Truth. She chose this name because she said her mission in life was to travel the nation and tell people the truth about slavery. Sojourner is another word for traveler. Besides being a freedom fighter, Sojourner Truth is also known for being the first African-American woman to win a lawsuit against a white man. Her son had been illegally sold to a plantation owner in the South. She sued the owner to free her son from slavery. Sojourner won the lawsuit and her son was freed. And this is a picture of her house. Spread the word. Sojourner Truth had to travel around the nation to teach people about the evils of slavery. Imagine that today you are Sojourner Truth and you want to change something about society. How will you go about spreading your message to others? Will you have to travel all over the country and maybe even around the world? Do you think there are better ways today to get the word out? I want you to pause the video here and in your notebook, describe how you would teach people about something that bothers you about society. Be sure to remember all the new tools that exist today to help you spread information to others. Born Isabella Bomfrey in Ulster County, New York in 1797, she later changed her name to Sojourner Truth to reflect her personal journey, journey towards truth. In her lifetime, Sojourner Truth saw her five children sold and taken away. Shortly before New York outlawed slavery in 1827, she took refuge with Isaac Van Wagner, who set her free. One of the first things she did was to successfully sue for the return of her young son, who was illegally sold in the South. After, her, or after his return, she moved to New York City. She had seen visions and heard voices. Since she was a young child, she assumed that it was God speaking to her. In New York, she had become a religious missionary, preaching in the streets. After she adopted the name Sojourner Truth, she took to the road in 1843, preaching and testifying at religious meetings around the country. 
she became famous and people flocked to hear her speak. She supported herself in part by selling copies of her book called The Narrative of Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth became a leading proponent of abolition and of the women's rights movement. She continued to tour the country, speaking at ever larger gatherings. She was very active in the women's suffrage movement, which was trying to get voting rights for women. During the Civil War, she raised funds and helped supply black volunteers for the, Un for the Union Army, which was the Army for the North. Abraham Lincoln met with her at the White House. After the war, she continued to work for the rights of newly freed slaves. She also continued her work in the women's suffrage movement. She eventually retired to her home in Battle Creek, Michigan, where she died on November 26, 1883. Her legacy of commitment and spirit of justice lives on as a symbol for all to admire. Frederick Douglass worked as a house slave in his early life, and he was taught to read and write. When he was only eight years old, his master died and Frederick was sold. His new owner sent him to work in the fields. Frederick did not let his education go to waste, however. He set up a Sunday school and taught there until angry white slave owners shut it down. In 1838, Frederick ran away to New York and worked as a day laborer. He joined the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society and spoke about freedom. Frederick Douglass published his life story in 1845. This act jeopardized his freedom because he was still considered a runaway slave. Frederick Douglass went to Ireland and England to speak out about slavery and women's rights. This allowed him to earn enough money to purchase his freedom and move back to the United States. Frederick had to flee to Canada when the governor of Virginia wanted to arrest him. Later, Frederick was able to return from Canada and assisted in the establishment of two Negro regiments, military groups that fought for the freedom in civil war. Unlike Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass was taught to read and write when he was a slave. Although his master soon forbade him to read, Frederick was able to continue learning from a book that he secretly bought. The more Frederick read, the more he despised slavery. He vowed to become a free man. Frederick ran away to New York City in 1838. Although he was in a free state, he still wasn't completely safe. If someone discovered he was an escaped slave, he could be sent back to his owner. Frederick eventually settled in Massachusetts where he joined the American Anti-Slavery Society. He was an accomplished speaker and he gave speeches about his life as a slave. He was careful to leave out the details that would identify him as an escaped slave. Concerned for his safety, Frederick traveled to Europe where he continued to speak out against slavery. Although he felt strongly about giving speeches in Europe, he missed his wife and children who had remained in the United States. He decided he wanted to return to the United States, but he was very worried about being captured and sent back to his master. His dilemma was solved when some English friends raised money for him so he could buy his freedom from his master. In 1846, Frederick's master was paid and Frederick became a free man. He was 28 years old. Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey was separated from his mother while he was still a baby. He never knew his father, who was a white man. He was taught to read and write by the wife of one of his masters, although it was against Maryland law. When her husband forbade her to continue, he continued his studies in secret. After several unsuccessful attempts, he finally managed to escape from the plantation in 1838. He lived first in New York City but soon found work as a laborer in the shipbuilding and whaling center of New Bedford, Massachusetts. He changed his name to Frederick Douglass to avoid being captured and returned to slavery. In 1841, he attended an anti-slavery convention in Nantucket, Massachusetts. In 
Asked to describe his experience as a slave, Douglas gave such a moving speech that he soon found himself in great demand as an anti-slavery speaker. What do you think? I want you to use your notebook to explain in your own words how a slave could become one of the most famous men in America. What was so special about Frederick Douglass? Go ahead and pause the video here so that you can write that in your notebook and then unpause when you're done. Still talking about Frederick Douglass, Douglass was a passionate speaker and he was in great demand. But the idea of a literate and articulate former slave was difficult for many to accept. So he was the constant target of insults and even violent attacks. In response to those who said that such a learned man could never have been a slave, in 1845, Douglas wrote his autobiography, Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. It became a bestseller and a classic of American literature. It's one of the most important primary sources of information about slavery from the slave's point of view. Douglas became a spokesman for the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. His speeches made him one of the most famous men in America. During the Civil War, Douglas was an advisor to President Lincoln and worked to recruit black soldiers into the Union Army. After the war, he worked hard to secure civil rights for former slaves, and he supported the women's rights movement. He was named to several government posts, including Consul General to Haiti, a small island nation in the Caribbean. So Joyner Truth and Frederick Douglass were similar in many ways. They broke both grew up as slaves and both fought for the rights of women and African Americans. You are like them in one particular way. You have the power to make a change if you see injustice. I want you to pause the video here and I want you to write a journal entry in your notebook about what you would change in your community if you could. It can be something simple such as picking up trash or something more complex such as trying to change a law that you think is unfair. You might even want to take this activity further by acting on your idea and trying to make a change. Go ahead and pause the video and write this journal entry in your notebook. Born into slavery on a Maryland plantation in 1817, Frederick Douglass went on to become a brilliant speaker, writer, editor, and public figure. He definitely wrote, defiantly wrote political commentaries in the newspaper he published, which was called the North Star. And he devoted his life to the cause of freedom. A fellow African-American leader and abolitionist, Sojourner Truth, became known as one of the best anti-slavery speakers of her day. Her strong sense of character and passion for freedom captivated audiences of all races. We're going to learn more about how these two former slaves crusaded for the abolition of slavery in the United States and became freedom-fighting heroes. But now it's your turn. Log into Time for Learning and complete the freedom activity first, and then the lesson quiz, Freedom Fighters. Then come back and resume the video. Harriet Tubman was called the Moses of her people. She fought for freedom for enslaved African Americans in the 1800s. Like Moses in the Bible, who led the people from bondage, Harriet Tubman also led people from slavery to freedom. For this reason, she was known as the Moses of her people. Harriet was a major figure of the Underground Railroad, and that was a network of people who were willing to provide a safe hiding place for slaves who were escaping to the north. With great courage, Harriet led more than 300 slaves to freedom. Harriet learned of the horrors of slavery at a very young age. Her first owner whipped her almost daily. As a young woman, Harriet escaped alone into the darkness of the night. She was escaping slavery and knew she would not be safe until she reached a free state in the north. To guide her northward, she followed the North Star at night and during the day, she followed the moss that grew on the north side of trees. 
she eventually reached the free state of Pennsylvania, where she worked for a year as a cook, maid, and a seamstress. After some time in Pennsylvania, Harriet devised a plan to bring her family to freedom. She became what they called a conductor for the Underground, underground Railroad. She returned to the South several times to guide her family and others from slavery. Her first trip as a conductor on the Underground Railroad brought her sister and her children out of slavery. On her second trip, she freed her brother and a few other slaves. The threat of capture became more dangerous with each journey, but Harriet would not stop. She eventually guided more than 300 African Americans to freedom. After the Civil War, Harriet Tubman continued fighting for freedom and became active in pushing for women's voting rights. Harriet died on March 10, 1913, at the age of 93. The county courthouse near her grave has a bronze tablet that reads, In memory of Harriet Tubman, called Moses of Her People. With rare courage, she led over 300 Negroes up from slavery to freedom and rendered invaluable services as nurse and spy. She braved every danger and overcome every obstacle. She possessed extraordinary foresight and judgment so that she truthfully said, on my Underground Railroad, I never ran my train off the track and I never lost a passenger. The goal for most slaves was freedom. Thankfully, there were many people willing to help slaves to a free life in Canada, Cuba, Mexico, the Bahamas, or even free northern states. A collection of the people became loosely organized into the Underground Railroad. Most slaves traveled north to Canada. They left their plantations in the south and traveled through Ohio, Indiana, and western Pennsylvania. The railroad they traveled wasn't real. It was a secret route linking safe house to safe house. Sometimes there were tunnels connecting houses so that the escaping slaves could travel in safety during the day. Slaves could find food, clothing, a place to sleep, and friendly faces in the safe houses. Escaping slaves were called packages, and the people who helped them were called conductors. Some conductors traveled with their passengers to ensure their safety. During the night, runaways traveled through the woods and then hid in homes, barns, and riverboats. If a master was following with dogs, the runaways had to jump in rivers so that the water would confuse the dogs. The dogs could no longer follow their scent. But how did they know where to go? Slaves learned how to use the North Star to guide them. One way they learned was from a song called The Drinking Gourd. A drinking gourd is a squash that's dried out and used as a dipper. In the song, the drinking gourd refers to the Big Dipper. The handle of the Big Dipper points to the North Star. The song goes like this, when the sun goes back and the first quail calls, follow the drinking gourd. The old man is a waiting for to carry you to freedom, follow the drinking gourd. The chorus says, follow the drinking gourd, follow the drinking gourd, for the old man is a waiting to carry you to freedom, follow the drinking gourd. The river bed makes a mighty fine road, dead trees to show you the way. And his left foot, peg foot, traveling on, follow the drinking gourd. The river ends between two hills, follow the drinking gourd. There's another river on the other side, follow the drinking gourd. I thought I heard the angel say, follow the drinking gourd. The stars in the heavens gonna show you the way, follow the drinking gourd. One famous conductor of the Underground Railroad was Harriet Tubman. Tubman was a former slave, so she knew how important freedom was to the people she helped. Her father had taught her to survive in the woods and find her way without any maps. Tubman traveled to the South 19 times and helped more than 300 slaves to their new free lives. Two important packages she carried were her parents. Her motto was, on my Underground Railroad, I never run my train off the track, and I've never lost a passenger. Tubman was so successful that slave owners set a $40,000 reward for her return to slavery. 
Even with this threat, she continued to conduct slaves to freedom in the North. Tubman's knowledge served the Union Army during the Civil War. She worked as a nurse, a scout, and a spy. Once, she led the Union Army fighters into Maryland to free more than 700 slaves. After the end of slavery, Tubman continued to work for Africans and African Americans. She raised money for schools for African Americans and helped older and poor blacks in their new lives as free men and women. Throughout the time that slavery was legal in the United States, slaves tried to escape. People who did not believe that slavery was right assisted them. An informal web of help for escaped slaves covered the United States. This web became known as the Underground Railroad, and it was found in Canada, Cuba, Mexico, the Bahamas, and the free northern states of the U.S. The goal was to provide freedom for the escaped slaves. Escaping slavery was in the thoughts of many slaves. Thousands of slaves did just that during the years when slavery was legal in the U.S. Most of the runaway slaves used the Underground Railroad for help. The most popular route was from the South to Canada through Indiana, Ohio, and Western Pennsylvania. Along this route were many stations or safe houses where runaways could find friends who gave them a place to sleep, food, and clothing. Sometimes there were even tunnels connecting buildings or homes so that the runaways could travel underground. People who helped the runaways were called conductors. Some conductors even traveled with the slaves. The runaways were called packages or stock so that other people wouldn't know what the con conductors were talking about. Slaves knew that a house was safe if they saw a lantern on a hitching post. The runaways had to travel at night in the woods so they would not be seen. They hid in homes, barns, and riverboats. Sometimes they had to jump into rivers because their owners would follow with dogs to sniff out their scent. The dogs would lose the slave's scent at the edge of the water. While traveling, runaway slaves followed the North Star which showed them the way to freedom. Assisting a runaway slave was against the law, so all the people who assisted slaves in escaping to freedom were doing something illegal. Pretend that you're a lawyer and that it's your job to prove that your client was doing nothing wrong when she let a runaway slave stay at her house and gave the slave food and clothes. Write your argument in your notebook. Go ahead and pause the video so you can write in your notebook. How long was the journey? The journey would have been approximately 600 miles. And it may have taken almost a year for some slaves to complete if the weather was bad. Harriet Tubman was one of the most famous conductors of the Underground Railroad. She had been a runaway slave herself, so she knew firsthand how important finding freedom was to the slaves she helped. After reaching freedom, Harriet traveled back into the dangerous South 19 times to lead others to freedom. She once said, on my Underground Railroad, I never run my train off the track and I've never lost a passenger. Harriet helped about 300 slaves, including her parents, escape to Canada through the Underground Railroad. She was successful because her father taught her about the woods. So she was at home finding her way without maps and was able to find food to feed the hungry runaways. Slave owners in the South knew that what a threat Harriet Tubman was to them and they tried to capture her and put her back into slavery. At one time, there was a $40,000 reward offered for her capture. During the Civil War, Harriet worked as a nurse, a scout, and a spy for the Union Army, which was the Army for the North. Her expertise in the woods was useful again. On one mission, she freed 750 slaves. After the war, she continued to help by raising money for black schools and assisting older and poor blacks. If you could devote your life to something that would help others, what would you do? Write in your notebook about your choice and what you would do if you could. Is there a way that you could start today? Go ahead and pause the video and write that in your notebook. 
Now it's your turn. You'll need to log in to Time for Learning and complete the quiz Harriet Tubman. When you're done, you can unpause the video. Now we're moving into learning about how women had to struggle for their rights. And the first thing we're going to learn about is fighting for the vote. Before 1920, women were not granted the right laid out in the Constitution, the right to vote. Women also lacked other rights back then. It took more than 70 years from the time of the first woman's right political meeting in Seneca Falls, New York, until the states voted on a constitutional amendment granting women the right to vote. In 1848, the Seneca Falls Convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York. Two women, already known for being reformers and women's rights activists, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Candy Stanton, invited others who believed in their cause of greater equality for women to join them near the home of the Stanton family. Reform was the primary reason for the gathering of women and men at the convention. They wanted changes in women's social, moral, legal, educational, and economic status. The Declaration of Sentiments, patterned after the Declaration of Independence, that's important to remember that the Declaration of Sentiments was patterned, or it looked like, the Declaration of Independence. It was written at the convention saying that all men and women are created equal. Obtaining the right to vote was a goal of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the famous abolitionist Frederick Douglass. It was considered the most radical demand presented at the Seneca Falls Convention. The goal of the convention was to give women rights equal to men, but the people at the convention decided that could be accomplished if women were granted the right to vote. Women could then assist in the making of other laws. In 1848, the Seneca Falls Convention was held in Seneca, New York during this antebellum period. Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Frederick Douglass fought for changes in women's social, moral, legal, education, and economic status. Together, they developed a plan for women to secure the right to vote. It was considered the most radical demand presented at the Seneca Falls Convention. The, first, or the fight for women to gain the right to vote in the United States was called the suffrage movement. That's important to remember. The suffrage movement was the fight for women to gain the right to vote in the U.S. Many people supported this movement, including Elizabeth Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Frederick Douglass, and someone called Amelia Bloomer. Bloomer published a newspaper called The Lily, which publicized the suffrages movement's cause. Although the key players in the women's suffrage movement lived in the Northeast, the first 10 states and territories to grant women the right to vote were all located west of the Mississippi River. In 1869, the Wyoming Territory was the first to adopt women's suffrage which granted the right, women the right to vote. In 1890, Congress voted by only a narrow margin to let Wyoming become a state. Many politicians in Congress voted against Wyoming statehood because of that territory stand on women's rights. That's important to remember, it's a test question. Why didn't Wyoming almost become a state? It's because they allowed women to vote. Wyoming believed that the right of women to vote was more important than the statehood. In 1870, the Utah Territory also adopted women's suffrage. Utah did not become a state until 1896. Fifteen more states granted women the right to vote. Most of them were west of the Mississippi. What do you think? Look at the map of the United States and locate Seneca Falls, New York. I went ahead and put a picture of New York and Seneca Falls that's blown up so you can see what it looks like. But it's up at the top right hand corner of the United States. 
I want you to write a journal entry in your notebook about why you think most of the places women could vote between 1869 and 1919 were located in the West. What are your thoughts on why that was? Go ahead and pause the video and write that in your journal. Years of hard work pay off. In 1890, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NAWSA, was formed. It was created by combining the two other women's suffrages, suffrage associations. The goal of the NAWSA was for Congress to pass a constitutional amendment giving women the right to vote, and then for the states to ratify that amendment. However, the NAWSA still worked at the state level to build support for the su women's suffrage movement. The suffragettes, as the women of this movement were known, distributed leaflets, held debates, and worked to educate the citizens of the United States about this issue. In 1918, President Woodrow Wilson began the process of introducing the constitutional amendment giving women the right to vote. This amendment passed both the House and the Senate in 1919, and then went to the states for ratification. Illinois and Wisconsin were the first states to ratify the amendment, and Alabama and Georgia were the first to reject the amendment. During the summer of 1920, the amendment needed only one more state to pass. Harry Byrne, a legislator from Tennessee, cast the deciding vote in that state. His elderly mother was the catalyst for his decision. Catalyst is the cause or the reason. Following ratification by the 36 necessary states, the 19th Amendment was adopted. On August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was passed, granting women the right to vote. That's important to remember that it was the 19th Amendment and it happened in 1920. So let's put it all together. On your map of the United States, I want you to point out where Illinois, Wisconsin, Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee are. Then, using the information that you just learned, I want you to construct a timeline of the women's suffrage movement. You can use pictures, illustrations, and colorful text to make your timeline interesting and easy to read. You need to cover the period between 1848 and the Seneca Falls Convention. I'm sorry, when the Seneca Falls Convention was held, all the way up to 1920 when women were granted the federal right to vote. You might also want to think about women's equality and rights in the present time. Is the fight over? Draw your timeline in your notebook. You can unpause the video when you're done. According to the Constitution of the United States, women had no rights before 1910. At times, they were even considered property. They could not own property, get a divorce, or vote. The emancipation process was a long one. More than 50 years passed from the first political meeting in Seneca, New York, until the states voted on the amendment to the U.S. Constitution that granted women equal rights and gave them the responsibility of voting. The 15th Amendment states that race or color cannot be used as an excuse to deny anyone the right to vote. The actual text reads, Amendment 15, Section 1. The right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section 2. The Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Two organizations were created for followers of the suffrage movement. The first, the National Women's Suffrage Association, was more radical and wanted federal action to grant women equal rights. It was opposed to the 15th Amendment. The other group for followers of the suffrage movement was called the American Women's Suffrage Association. It worked for equality at the state level, and it supported the 15th Amendment. Susan B. Anthony, 
made a radical move in 1872. She tried to vote and was arrested. She was charged and fined, but Susan B. Anthony vowed she would never pay it. In 1875, the case went to the Supreme Court where it was ruled that just being a citizen did not grant an individual the right to vote. The Supreme Court granted the right to individual states to rule on this issue. Female enfranchisement was now the job of individual states. Although the key players in the women's suffrage movement lived in the Northeast, the first nine states that granted women the right to vote were all located west of the Mississippi. This shows those states. The states supported the suffrage movement for many reasons. Frontier conditions and difficult living broke down traditional gender roles, so allowing women to vote was a natural progression. Many people thought that allowing women to vote would help civilize the West. The Mormon population, a large religious group that had settled in the Utah Territory, may have been trying to gain political power. By granting the large population of Mormon women the right to vote, the Mormons would have the political majority against the non-Mormon population. How would living in the frontier change the roles of men and women? What would the West gain from granting women the right to vote? And how would the Mormons gain political power by granting women the right to vote? Record your reflections in your notebook. Unpause the video when you're done. In 1890, the National American Women's Suffrage Association was formed by combining the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association. The NAWSA demonstrated an amendment, I'm sorry, they demanded an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, but they still worked at the state level to build support for the suffrage movement. The goal of the NAWSA was for Congress to pass a federal amendment and then for all of the states to vote and ratify it. The women of the group distributed leaflets, held debates, and worked to educate the citizens of the United States. Supporters of the progressive movement joined the supporters of the suffrage movement in 1900. The followers of the progressive movement felt that their issues would benefit from the work of the suffragettes. In 1900, the progressive movement supported protection for workers, the ending of child labor, and the creation of food and drug legislation. They joined with the suffrage movement to work for these causes. Carrie Chapman Kate was the president of the NAWSA in 1915 when the group worked to support the war effort for World War I. This action gained support from Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States. In 1918, President Wilson began the Federal Amendment, which was then approved by Congress. In 1919, Illinois and Wisconsin were the first to ratify the amendment. Alabama and Georgia were the first to reject the amendment. During the summer of 1920, the amendment needed only one more state to pass. Harry Byrne, a legislator, was the deciding vote in Tennessee, and his elderly mother was the catalyst for his decision. On August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment was passed, granting women the right to vote. Using the information you just learned, construct a timeline of the women's suffrage movement. Cover the period between 1849, when the Seneca Falls Convention was held, until 1920, when women were granted the federal right to vote. Be sure to include the following events in your timeline. When Susan B. Anthony was arrested. When the Supreme Court ruled on her case. When did Wyoming's territory adopt women's suffrage? Other frontier territories grant women the right to vote. When was the NAWSA formed? When was the progressive movement 
joining in the fight, and when was the 19th Amendment passed? Go ahead and pause the video here. You may rewind if you need to, to look back at the facts to make your timeline. Women have been allowed to vote for less than 90 years. When the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution, they gave certain rights to all citizens, but for many years neither blacks nor women were able to act upon many of those rights. One right both groups were denied was the right to vote. The battle for the right of women to vote started to heat up in 1848 at the Seneca Falls Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton led the convention of men and women who were interested in women's suffrage and women's rights. Suffrage means the right to vote. The Seneca Falls Convention was the first convention in history to be held to discuss women's rights. Mott and Stanton were leaders in the fight for women's rights. At the convention, about 70 women and 30 men signed a document written by Elizabeth Stanton. The document was called the Declaration of Sentiments. It was very similar to the Declaration of Independence but it emphasized the social, economic, and political inequalities both men and women faced. One of the most important lines of the document stated, all men and women are created equal. The Declaration of Independence states that all men are created equal. The purpose of the Declaration of Sentiments was to show that women are being deprived of rights that they deserve. The women who fought for the women's suffrage were called suffragettes. Some men joined in the suffragette struggle and believed that women deserved the same rights as men. One man, Frederick Douglass, Douglass was an escaped slave who worked closely with Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Douglass was the only African American to attend the Seneca Falls Convention. The fight for women's rights was not an easy one, especially when it came to giving women the right to vote. For example, Congress wanted to prevent Wyoming from becoming a state after the Wyoming Territory granted women the right to vote in 1869. Wyoming declared that it would rather stay out of the Union than deny women the right to vote. Congress finally granted Wyoming statehood in 1890 and allowed, the Wyoming, allowed Wyoming to keep women's suffrage. Several other states in the West granted women the right to vote before it became a constitutional right in 1920. But remember, even though women in these states could vote in state elections, they still could not vote in national elections until 1920. Women could not vote for the President of the United States until 1920. In 1890, the National American Women's Suffrage Association was formed. It was formed from the combination of two women's suffrage groups, the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association. Members of the NAWSA handed out leaflets, held debates, and worked to educate people about the importance of allowing women to vote. Because of the ceaseless work of the members of the NAWSA, Congress finally proposed a suffrage amendment in 1918. The proposed amendment was a huge step forward for women, but the battle would not be won until three-fourths of the states ratified or approved the amendment. Illinois and Wisconsin were the first states to ratify the amendment. During the summer of 1920, the amendment needed a yes vote from only one more state. Legislator Harry Byrne was the deciding vote in Tennessee. Although Byrne was originally against the amendment at the last minute, he received a note from his mother reminding him to vote in favor of it. He voted yes to the amendment. On August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment was passed, giving all women the right to vote in all elections. Now it's time for your flashcards. See if you can guess the answer. When did the women's struggle for voting rights begin to heat up? In 1848 at the Seneca Falls Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. What two women organized the Seneca Falls Convention? In 
Lucretia Mott, and Elizabeth Caddy Stanton. Why did Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Caddy Stanton organize the convention? They believed that women deserved the same legal and political rights as men. Women deserve the right to vote. Why did Congress originally prohibit Wyoming from joining the Union? Wyoming Territory had granted women the right to vote in 1869. What document was written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and signed by about 70 women and 30 men at the Seneca Falls Convention? The Declaration of Sentiments. The Declaration of Sentiments was very similar to what other historical document? The Declaration of Independence. What amendment to the Constitution gave women the right to vote? The 19th Amendment. What was the 19th Amendment? When was the 19th Amendment passed, giving women the right to vote? It was passed in 1920. Now let's talk about the children's rights movement. Giving women the right to vote was one of the most important issues on the minds of women and men who attended the Seneca Falls Convention. If you were going to hold a convention to discuss some very important issues, what might those issues be? Write a paragraph describing what issues you would discuss at your convention. Maybe you would want to argue for a later bedtime, more computer time, or the right to earn more money by mowing lawns or shoveling sidewalks. Try to get other kids on your side by writing a persuasive argument. For example, many men help women in their struggle for the right to vote, even though men could already vote. Who would join you in your struggle? What struggles would you have to endure? You can go ahead and pause the video and put that in your notebook now. Now it's time for you to log in to Time for Learning and complete the quiz, Women's Struggles for Rights. In 1800s and early 1900s, many women and men fought for the right to vote, or what we would call women's suffrage. Women did not have the right to vote because many people thought women should concern themselves only with their homes and their families. Women also lacked other basic rights, for example, they couldn't go to most colleges, and they could only get a few types of jobs, such as a nurse or an elementary school teacher. Some women stayed in bad marriages because they wouldn't be able to support themselves and their children if they left. If a woman had property when she married, her property became her husband's, and some laws allowed the men to beat their wives to make them obedient. As interest in the rights of slaves grew, interest in women's rights grew as well. Often, people who fought for women's rights were also abolitionists, or those who fought for slaves' rights. Three fighters for women's rights became famous in the late 1800s, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Moss, and Amelia Bloomer. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, one of the first women's rights activists, was Elizabeth Cady Stanton. As a young girl, Elizabeth worked and studied more than most girls were expected to. She studied law with her father, a U.S. congressman and New York State Supreme Court justice. She learned about discrimination against women and became determined to challenge it. But Elizabeth could not practice law because she was a woman. Instead of going to college, she had to attend finishing school so she could learn to be a proper lady. As a young woman, Elizabeth met escaped slaves at her cousin's house. She also met abolitionist Henry Stanton, whom she married. He supported her goal of equal rights for women. With her husband, Stanton went to an anti-slavery conference in London. While her husband could go into the meeting, Elizabeth and all other women were shut out. 
Stanton met Lucretia Moss at this meeting, and they planned their own convention where women would be the focus. Their efforts turned into the famous Convention on Women's Rights held in 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York. Later, Elizabeth teamed up with Susan B. Anthony. Together, they formed the National Women's Suffrage Association. Stanton was the president of the organization from 1869 to 1890. After spending her life fighting for the right to vote, Elizabeth died in 1902. Women were given, officially given the right to vote 18 years later in 1920. So she never got to see the fruits of her efforts, but she was important nonetheless. Lucretia Moss, Mott, I'm sorry, Lucretia Mott, which was the lady that she met in London. Imagine that you've studied hard to become a teacher. Finally, you get the job you want. You start your job happily and do good work, but one day you find that your co-workers are paid twice as much as you are. Why? Because they're men and you're a woman. This happened to Lucretia Mott. When she was 15, she became a teacher. When she found out that she was paid only half as much as the male teachers, she became interested in women's rights. Lucretia, a Quaker, eventually married fellow teacher James Mott. They moved to Philadelphia, where their home became the station a station on the Underground Railroad. In 1848, Mott helped organize the Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. She worked with Elizabeth Cady Stanton to write the Seneca Falls Declaration. In 1850, Mott described the restrictions women faced in her book called Discourse on Women. Mott also wrote articles and lectured widely. She worked for women's rights until her death on November 11, 1880. Elizabeth Cady Stanton worked with Lucretia Mott to write the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions at the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention. They based their declaration on the Declaration of Independence because they felt women's problems with the government and society were similar to the problems the original colonists had with the British government. Amelia Bloomer lived in Seneca Falls when the Women's Rights Convention was held, but she focused at first on the temperance issue. Women who wanted temperance wanted people to stop abusing alcohol. In 1849, Bloomer began publishing The Lily. It was a monthly newspaper that encouraged temperance or people to stop using alcohol. But soon, the paper began to cover women's issues as well. One topic Bloomer wrote about was clothing. In the mid-1800s, women wore uncomfortable, restrictive clothing. Corsets made it hard to breathe naturally, and heavy, long skirts often got in the way. To give women an alternative, Amelia invented loose, full pants gathered at the ankles. They were a lot more comfortable than the usual win women's clothing. But many people thought they were scandalous, like wearing underwear in public. A woman had to be very brave to wear them. Since Amelia Bloomer encouraged women to wear them, the pants became known as bloomers. Now it's your turn to log into Time for Learning and complete the quiz, Harriet Tubman. Actually, I think it's not going to be the Harriet Tubman quiz. I may have messed up on this slide. But the next quiz that you're supposed to complete for the women's rights. All right. In your notebook, I want you to decide if the following statements are true or false and write the answers in your notebook. Number one, only women supported women's suffrage. Number two, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton organized the Seneca Falls Convention. Number three, Amelia Bloomer started the National Women's Suffrage Association. Number four, Elizabeth Cady Stanton went to college and became a lawyer. Number five, Stanton was able to vote for the first time on her 90th birthday.
Number six, everyone liked bloomers. Number seven, at first, the lily publicized the temperance movement. And number eight, Mott's book, Discourse on Women, publicized the restrictions women faced in the United States. The fight for women's rights had many supporters, including men and women all over the world. Three famous women who fought in the United States were Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and Amelia Bloomer. They were all known for their contribution to different aspects of the fight, but they were consistent in what they wanted, the right to vote and changes in the laws that discriminated against women. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was one of the first women's rights activists. She was the daughter of a lawyer who was disappointed that she had not been a boy so she too could have practiced law. Elizabeth worked and studied to learn all that was traditionally taught to boys, but she could not go to college. Instead, she had to go to finishing school. She met and married Henry Stanton, who was an abolitionist. He supported her in all her efforts to gain equal rights. Elizabeth tried to attend an anti-slavery convention in London, but she and other women were excluded. Only the men could enter the convention. Elizabeth met Lucretia Mott, and they decided to hold their own convention. This became the famous Seneca Falls Convention in New York. Elizabeth and Susan B. Anthony started the National Women's Suffrage Association in 1869, and Elizabeth was its president until 1890. The group and the women, I'm sorry, the group and the women's suffrage movement had their first real success in 1878 when Senator Sargent of California sponsored the women's suffrage amendment. This was the first formal action toward passing a federal law giving women the right to vote. The amendment had to be resubmitted yearly until it passed in 1919. Elizabeth died in 1902, 18 years before women were able to vote for the first time. Elizabeth Cady Stanton died 18 years before women could vote for the first time. If she had been alive then, what do you think her reaction would have been? In your notebook, I want you to write Elizabeth a letter telling her that she can finally vote. Then create Elizabeth's letter of response to you describing her reaction to the news. Write these letters in your notebook. Lucretia Mott was a teacher and then a Quaker minister. She organized many conventions throughout her life including the Anti-Slavery Convention of American Women and the Seneca Falls Convention, which she organized with Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She assisted Elizabeth in writing the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments, which was modeled after the Declaration of Independence. In 1850, she wrote a book titled Discourse on Women, which told of the many restrictions placed on women. She then traveled and spoke on the topic of giving freed blacks the right to vote. She was disappointed when only black men were given this right. In 1864, she helped to found Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. Amelia Bloomer was the writer of The Lily, a paper designed to spread the temperance movement. The temperance movement tried to outlaw drinking alcohol. The paper then widened to topics to include all types of reforms. Amelia is best known for wearing bloomers. Named after Amelia, bloomers were very full pants gathered at the ankles. They were the first type of women's pants. However, few women wore them because people would scold them or make fun of them. Amelia can also be credited for creating one of the great teams of women's suffrage. She introduced Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Wearing bloomers was a very visible way for women to make their point about equality. In your notebook, write a list of the pros and cons of wearing bloomers. Pretend that you're a clothing manufacturer and you're trying to decide whether it would be smart to manufacture bloomers. Try to think of at least four arguments for and four arguments against manufacturing bloomers during the mid-1800s.
in your notebook, write the answers to these 10 questions. One, who was excluded from an anti-slavery convention in London with Lucretia Mott? Two, who organized the anti-slavery convention of American women? Three, who encouraged Senator Sargent to sponsor the women's suffrage amendment? Four, who was a Quaker minister? Five, who introduced Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton? Six, who wrote the book Discourse on Women? Seven, who helped organize the Seneca Falls Convention and write the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments with Lucretia Mott? Eight, who helped to found Swarthmore College? Nine, who wrote The Lily? And 10, who wore the first pants? Now it's your turn to log in to Time for Learning and complete the quiz, Contributors to Women's Rights. Women's Rights Leaders, the doctor and the The first woman doctor in the United States was Elizabeth Blackwell. She was allowed to attend med medical school only because the school thought it was a joke that a woman was applying. She succeeded and worked to make the field of medicine accessible to women the first woman to be represented on a regularly circulated United States currency was Susan B. Anthony. She was chosen to represent the women's suffrage movement. These two women worked constantly to further the cause of women's rights. Elizabeth Blackwell became the first woman doctor in the United States after she was allowed to attend Geneva College. She had already applied to 29 medical schools but was turned down because she was a woman. The only reason she was accepted to Geneva was that the school thought it was a joke. She had a very difficult time gaining the respect of the other students and the patients. In New York, Elizabeth eventually started her own medical practice with her sister. Elizabeth spoke about and practiced medicine in England and worked to open the medical field to women. She was one of the first to believe that personal hygiene and sterilizing things helped to stop the spread of disease. In 1949, the American Medical Women's Association created the Elizabeth Blackwell Medal to honor the woman doctor who has made the biggest difference. The medal has been awarded each year since 1949. Susan B. Anthony was a pioneer for women's rights. She was born into a Quaker family, which believed that all people are equal. Quakers supported all reform efforts, including the anti-slavery and temperance movements. While teaching in New York, Susan founded the Women's State Temperance Society. She also formed the National Women's Suffrage Association with her friend Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The two women worked together throughout their adult lives to promote the cause of women's suffrage. Susan B. Anthony published a journal called The Revolution, which printed writings on suffrage and other reform issues. In 1872, Susan voted in the presidential election and was arrested. Unfortunately, this was the only election Susan ever voted in because she died 14 years before women were granted the right to vote. In 17, or I'm sorry, in 1979 and 1980, the Susan B. Anthony dollar was minted and circulated. Minted means it was formed and circulated means it was passed throughout the United States. Susan B. Anthony was the first woman to be pictured on the U.S. coin that was in regular circulation. Both Elizabeth Blackwell and Susan B. Anthony were honored for their work to further women's rights. If you were in charge of choosing a modern woman to honor for her efforts, who would you choose and how would you honor her? You could create a medal, a scholarship, a monument, or something else. Use your imagination and design the project after you clearly state why the person you chose deserves this honor. Describe your selection and your project in your notebook. In your notebook, write whether each statement is true or false. Number one, Elizabeth Blackwell was accepted to every medical school to which she applied. Number two, in New York, Elizabeth Blackwell eventually started her own medical practice with her sister. <laughs> Number three, Elizabeth Blackwell 
was one of the first to believe that personal hygiene and sterilizing things help stop the spread of disease. Number four. In 1872, Susan B. Anthony voted in the presidential election and was arrested. Number five, Susan B. Anthony was able to vote legally for the first time 14 years after she was arrested for voting. Women who made a difference. After applying to 29 medical schools and being turned down by all of them simply because she was a woman, Elizabeth Blackwell was admitted to Geneva College in Geneva, New York. Geneva College accepted her application because its mission staff thought her application was a joke. While in school, Blackwell worked hard and had a difficult time with the male students. She suffered prejudice and lack of respect. In 1849, Elizabeth Blackwell graduated as the first woman doctor. After graduating from medical school, Blackwell moved to England, where she worked in hospitals. When she moved back to New York in 1851, she was barred from hospitals and few patients trusted her judgment. Eventually, she opened her own hospital with her sister. The hospital served mostly poor people in New York and was staffed by women. Blackwell moved back to England in 1869 and continued to work to make the medical field open to women. Her belief that sterilization was the key to stopping the spread of disease was revolutionary. In 1949, the American Medical Women's Association created the Elizabeth Blackwell Medal. Since that time, a woman doctor has been selected each year as the woman who has made the biggest difference in medicine. Susan B. Anthony was born into a Quaker family. Quakers believed in equality for all people. Most Quakers supported all reform efforts from temperance to the abolition of slavery. Susan B. Anthony became a teacher in New York, where she founded the Women's New York State Temperance Society. Another famous fighter for women's rights was Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She paired with Susan B. Anthony to start the National Women's Suffrage Association. These two women became friends and spent their adult lives fighting for women's suffrage. One of the ways in which Anthony worked to spread the word about women's suffrage was through a journal called Revolution. This journal was filled with writings on suffrage and other reform issues. Anthony is most famous for something she did on election day in 1872. She voted in the presidential election and was arrested. She was never able to vote legally because she died 14 years before women were given the right to vote. In 1979, the Susan B. Anthony dollar was first minted in the United States. For a long time, the Susan B. Anthony dollar was the only coin in regular circulation, celebrating the hard work of a woman. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton joined together in the fight for women's rights because they were angered by the inequalities between women and men. Women had to pay taxes, but they could not vote. They could also be arrested, but could not serve on a jury. In many states, they were denied property rights. Women, like men, could work and receive a formal education, but their jobs and their school opportunities were not equal to those of men. Anthony and Stanton worked together to bring the same rights to women as were granted to men. They also worked to help each other. Stanton was married and had seven children. In order to help Stanton and to help the cause of women's suffrage, Anthony often went to Stanton's home to care for Stanton's children. While Anthony watched Stanton's children, Stanton could work on speeches, letters, and other work that eventually brought the vote to women. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Blackwell are only two of many women who work for equality and change. See if you can find a woman in your community or elsewhere who is working to make a difference and write a journal entry in your notebook about this inspirational woman. You might have to use Google. In your notebook, I want you to write down and decide whether each statement describes either Elizabeth Blackwell or Susan B. Anthony. You're going to write number one, and you'll either write EB, 
or SBA. EB standing for Elizabeth Blackwell or SBA standing for Susan B. Anthony. Number one, this woman was a Quaker. Number two, this woman graduated as the first woman doctor in the United States. Number three, this woman had to move to England to practice her job. Number four, this woman started the National Women's Suffrage Association and the Women's New York State Temperance Society. Number five, this woman believed that sterilization was the key to preventing the spread of disease. Number six, this woman published a journal called Revolution. Number seven, this woman had a medal which is awarded yearly, created in her honor. And number eight, this woman had a coin minted in her honor. Now it's your turn. Log into Time for Learning and complete the quiz, Women's Rights Leaders. Fighting for a cause. During the 1800s, the United States was not a country of equality and fairness for all. Groups of people called reformers worked to change the inequality and unfairness and to make a country a better place for all people. Reformers worked to improve education and expand women's rights and workers' rights. Many were also involved in issues such as slavery and temperance. One famous reformer was Horace Mann. He saw the need for reform in education. He got the government to increase the amount of money spent on students and he improved teacher training. His efforts led to the establishment of free public elementary schools in most northern states by the 1850s because they didn't exist before then. Only higher education existed before then. Abolitionists were people who worked to end slavery. So Joyner Truth and Frederick Douglass were former slaves who became famous abolitionists. Many abolitionists also fought for women's rights. Until 1920, women did not have the constitutional right to vote. Women everywhere gained suffrage in 1920, when the 19th Amendment was passed. Two famous women who led the women's suffrage struggle were Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Some reformers during the 1800s fought to improve workers' rights. The fight included keeping children out of a dangerous working condition. People who fought for workers' rights also wanted the workday to be shortened. In the 1860s, most people worked about 12 hours a day, six days a week, and many people did not even get Sunday off. Dorothea Dix saw horrible conditions in prisons that she visited. She was especially angered by the treatment of the mentally ill in the prisons. She led a movement to improve conditions for prison inmates. She also worked to improve treatment of the mentally ill. Because of her efforts and the efforts of those who joined her cause, mentally ill people were removed from prisons. They were moved to special hospitals where they could receive treatment for their illnesses. Children at work. What do you think life was like for a child worker in the 1800s? Do you think it was a lot different from your life today? In your notebook, write a journal entry of a typical day in your life. Did you go to school? Did you play with your friends? Did you get to play any sports or do any special activities? Did you eat breakfast and dinner at home? And then write another journal entry pretending that you're a child worker in the 1800s. What do you think your day would be like? Include as much description as possible. The Temperance Movement People who joined the Temperance Movement were fighting to limit the sale and drinking of alcohol. They believed that alcohol was the cause of many social problems. Alcohol was blamed for family problems, health problems, and financial problems. Charles Langston and Lyman Beecher were very involved in the Temperance Movement. Charles Langston was a member of the Sons of Temperance, an anti-alcohol group. Lyman Beecher was a minister who preached against the drinking of alcohol. Mm. 
The Sons of Temperance was only one of the groups that formed to spread the word that alcohol consumption caused many problems in society. Two other important groups were the American Temperance Society and the Daughters of Temperance. Members of the Temperance Movement carried signs similar to this one pictured. I do not drink, do you abstain, temperance volunteers. Match the name of the individual with his or her description. Write the correct letter next to the number in your notebook. A is Frederick Douglass, B is Sojourner Truth, C is Susan B. Anthony, D is Charles Langston, and E is Lyman Beecher. Number one, he preached against the drinking of alcohol. He was a member of the temperance movement. Two, she fought for women's rights, including women's rights to vote. Number three, she was a former slave and famous abolitionist. Number four, he was a former slave and famous abolitionist. And number five, he believed alcohol was to blame for many of society's problems. He was a member of the Sons of Temperance group. Also in your notebook, Write true or false after you've numbered one through seven on your paper. Number one, reformer was the name given to people who tried to change society during the 1800s. Number two, temperance refers to the change that was taking place in education during this time. Number three, Horace Mann was a former slave who fought to end slavery. Number four, a person who believed that slaves are an economic necessity is called an abolitionist. Number five, suffrage means the right to vote. Number six, Dorothea Dix worked to improve prison conditions and treatment of the mentally ill. And number seven, Charles Langston and Lyman Beecher fought for better working conditions for children. Reformers and Temperance Movement. During the 1800s, many people worked for a variety of causes. These people preached reform in education, women's rights, workers' rights, temperance, and for the anti-slavery movement. People who fought for these causes were called reformers. Temperance reformers wanted people to drink less alcohol, and some wanted alcoholic beverages outlawed completely. This is a picture of an unidentified woman holding a copy of the book Sons of Temperance Offering in 1851. The famous reformer Horace Mann focused his efforts on education reform. He worked with other people to make the educational system in the United States better for students. He wanted to increase the amount of money spent on education and to improve teacher training and curriculum. Many abolitionists worked for the anti-slavery movement. They fought to end slavery and supported legislation to give blacks equal rights. Some famous abolitionists included Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth. The struggle for women's rights encouraged many people to band together and fight for reform efforts. Some women, such as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, spent their entire lives fighting for women's rights, including the right to vote. Some other reform efforts focused on workers' rights. These reformers worked to regulate the workday and to keep children out of work that was dangerous. Dorothea Dix spent her adult life working to make prisons and mental health institutions more humane. This is a draft of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's The Woman's Bible. Answer these questions in your notebook. A reformer is a person who blank. Horace Mann is famous for his support of blank. Abolitionists work to be to better the lives of blank. Women fought primarily for the right to blank. Another type of reform in the 1800s was blank. During colonial times, people drank alcoholic beverages because they were cheaper and safer to drink than other beverages. Water was not always very clean and milk was not always disease free. 
Some people became concerned at the amount of alcohol being consumed and its effects on society. Alcohol was blamed for poverty, health problems, and family neglect. Some religious leaders also felt that drinking alcohol was immoral. Some people felt that the recent immigrants from Europe would become more American if they followed stricter rules such as not drinking. The move to end the drinking of alcoholic beverages was called the temperance movement. Two famous fighters for the temperance movement were Charles Langston and Lyman Beecher. Charles Langston was part black, part white, and part Indian. He was involved in the anti-slavery movement and was part of the Sons of Temperance group. Lyman Beecher started the American Society for the Promotion of Temperance. Both men spent their lives spreading the word and the cause of temperance. In the years from 1880 to 1914, states started to support laws for prohibition. Prohibition made it illegal to sell, drink, or make alcoholic beverages. For a short time, all of North America supported prohibition. True or false? Write this, the answers in your notebook. Number one, temperance movement aimed to stop the drinking of alcoholic beverages. Two, people thought that drinking alcohol was good for a person's health. Three, mothers preached that drinking alcohol was immoral. Number four, Lyman Beecher and Charles Langston fought for the temperance movement. And number five, the reformers achieved their goal of outlawing the sale of alcohol. Now it's your turn to pause the video log in the time for learning and complete the quiz reformers and movements fighting for what's right throughout the years many people have fought for the rights of others two who fought for the rights of those who could not fight for themselves were horace mann and dorothea dix they were reformers who fought to make life better for others horace mann is considered the father of american education he spent his adult life fighting for better education for all children. Dorothea Dix was a teacher who was shocked at conditions that existed then in mental hospitals. She worked until she was 80 years old, spreading the word about the horrible conditions and trying to make institution, mental institutions more humane. Horace Mann was so poor when he was a child that he could not go to school for more than 10 weeks a year. Instead of looking forward to his short time in the classroom, he dreaded it. His teachers beat him with a stick. This was a common practice when Horace was a schoolboy. Teachers would frequently whip their students for minor infractions such as squirming or not paying attention. Horace did not agree with the way school was taught. When Horace was 20 years old, he decided he needed an education. He studied hard to catch up and was accepted to Brown University. He became a lawyer and a state senator. The job he held, which he made the most impact, was as secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education. During his 12 year, years on the Board of Education from 1837 to 1849, Horace Mann made many reforms. He made such changes as doubling the amount of money spent on education, doubling teacher, teacher salaries, improving the curriculum, and making sure that every student went to school for at least six months a year. He also set up the first schools in which teachers could get training. Compared with the current school system, the system set up by Horace might seem simplistic, but schools would not be where they are today if it had not been for Horace Mann, the father of American education. You are the principal. Horace Mann believed that quality education costs money and that curriculum and teacher training were important. He also believed that students should go to school consistently. Current educational systems are based on many individual ideas. If you were in charge of your own school, what types of things would be important to you? What do you think is the best way to teach? Create a brochure for your school, highlighting things, 
that you think are important in giving students a good environment for learning. Be sure to make your brochure colorful and creative so potential students and parents would be interested in your school. Some items you may wish to include are the name and address of the school and the grades that you teach. A statement that tells what your school believes in and what it plans to achieve. Any school policies regarding homework, the dress code, and so on. A school calendar of events, like the days you're in and out of school. And any activities. Write this in your notebook. Sophia Dix spent many of her childhood, spent much of her childhood alone or in the company of her adult family. Her father was a traveling preacher and her mother died when Dorothea was young. So she spent most of her time with a variety of relatives. When she was 39 years old, she visited a jail in Massachusetts and was appalled at the conditions there especially the fact that criminals were jailed with mentally insane people. She looked further and found horrible conditions such as people who were kept in closets and cages or tied up and locked in pens like animals. They were naked and whipped or blasted with water. Dorothea Dix fought for changes in these conditions until she was 80 years old. She visited other countries and moved around the United States telling people about the plight of the mentally ill and the people in prisons. She wrote many articles to help her cause. She was able to get the support of many famous and wealthy Americans who assisted her in making the conditions in these institutions more humane. Many laws were passed that Dorothea suggested and for which she lobbied tirelessly. Dorothea Dix felt compassion for other people which she also demonstrated during her service as superintendent of the Union Army nurses during the Civil War. Today's activists, Dorothea Dix and Horace Mann were two people who acted in their local communities and made an impact around the nation and the world. Can you find any people who are doing the same things today? Look first in your local community and see whether anyone is working for positive change. If you can't find anyone in your local community, broaden your search to the state or the nation. Look at the people you find and the activities in which they are involved. What things do today's activists have in common with one another? And in what ways are they making a difference? Discuss what you found with other explorers or with me. Or write a journal entry in your notebook about what you find and the conclusions you drew from your research. You will have to use Google for this research. Who is who? In your notebook, you'll write HM for Horace Mann or DD for Dor Dorothea Dix in response to these statements. Number one, was a poor child who did not go to much public school. Number two, spent most childhood years with relatives. Number three, did not like the way school was taught. Number four, was appalled at the conditions in mental institutions and prisons. Number five, worked for change until the age of 80. Number six, was on the Massachusetts Board of Education for 12 years. Number seven, became a lawyer after attending Brown University. And number eight, worked for the Union Army during the Civil War. Throughout history, many men and women have fought for the rights of others and have struggled to make life better for less fortunate people. Two people who devoted their lives to helping others were Dorothea Dix and Horace Mann. Dorothea Dix was a school teacher in Massachusetts in 1841 when she visited a jail to teach a Sunday school class. She was shocked by what she saw at the jail. Inmates were crowded together in dirty, cold cells, and first-time offenders were thrown in with serious criminals. Dix was most offended by the treatment of the mentally ill at the jail. She was so appalled by what she saw at the jail that she spent the rest of her life fighting for social reforms. She argued for better conditions at jails and was especially focused on getting proper treatment for the mentally ill. At the Massachusetts jail, she noticed that 
the mentally ill were being treated horribly as if they were violent criminals. She believed that the mentally ill deserved treatment at special hospitals where they could be helped. She worked tirelessly to persuade the government to remove the mentally ill from jails. As part of her efforts, she traveled around the state and then around the country visiting jails. She publicized the awful conditions she saw and the treatment of the mentally ill that she witnessed. Because of her ceaseless work, states began to refer, reform their jail systems and to build special hospitals for the treatment of the mentally ill. Imagine that you had to go to school where kids were not allowed to have recess, and they had to eat lunch in a very cold room where the lights were dim. In your notebook, write a newspaper article in which you describe the conditions at this made-up school. Convince the people who read your article that kids deserve better conditions and treatment. In the early 1800s, the United States did not have a free public school system like the one that exists today. Some children went to school for only a few months a year. Many children could not go to school at all. Teachers worked hard at their jobs, but they often had very little training. If a town actually had a school building, it was usually in bad shape. In the 1830s, people began to demand reforms in education that would allow all children to attend school. Horace Mann was one of the leaders of the educational reform movement. As a child, Mann was so poor he was only able to go to school for about 10 weeks a year. He was determined to get an education, though, and he eventually attended Brown University and became a lawyer. In 1837, Mann became the secretary of the new Massachusetts Board of Education. As secretary of the board, Mann had some power to improve education. He worked with others to set up schools to train teachers. He also began a system that would allow schools throughout the state to teach the same subjects at each grade level. This way, a fifth grader in the southern part of the state would learn the same thing as a fifth grader in the northern part of the state. Because of the hard work of Horace Mann and other education reformers, almost all white children could attend a free elementary school by the 1850s. Free and enslaved African Americans were not allowed in most public schools at that time. This reformer worked tirelessly to improve jail conditions and to provide special hospitals for mentally ill people. Who do you think that was? This reformer worked to provide free elementary education for children. Who was that? Horace Mann. Dorothea Dix was a school teacher in what state? Massachusetts. Horace Mann was the secretary of what state board of education? Also Massachusetts. When public schools were open, could all children attend them? African Americans were not allowed to attend most public schools. In your notebook, write true or false next to each number. Number one, Dorothea Dix worked to improve education. Number two, Dorothea Dix worked as a school teacher in Maine. Number three, there were many excellent free public schools in the early 1800s. Number four, Dorothea Dix wanted to improve jail conditions and provide proper care for the mentally ill. Number five, Horace Mann worked hard to establish free elementary schools for children. Number six, Horace Mann became a lawyer after he went to Brown University. And number seven, by the late 1800s, all children could get a free elementary education.
You may now take the quiz, Horace Mann and Dorothea Day. Be sure to look back and review through your test before you take it. 